Hi everyone, I'm Debbie Roberts from Property Apprentice. Join me today for the Week in Review where I'll talk about current events for the everyday investor and home buyer. So topics for this week, on the 8th of August, One Roof published an article that said when the bank says no to a mortgage application. Second topic, Mortgage Mag on the 8th of August, latest survey was good news for the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. Third topic, landlords.co.nz on the 8th of August, rental property prices inch up and property sales slump to a new low. On the 9th of August, One Roof published an article called Why the Bank of Mum and Dad is Now Moving In with the Kids. And last but not least, on the 10th of August, Radio New Zealand, falling house prices put some homeowners into negative equity. So we'll start off this week in review by talking about when the bank says no to a mortgage application from One Roof on the 8th of August. Getting a no from the bank can obviously be devastating for first-time buyers. Global Financial Services Head of Mortgage, Asim Agarwal, says that the bank usually says no to a mortgage application because of the following factors. Insufficient income, excessive spending, low deposit, account conduct, credit score, residency or age. The issue can stem from any one of those things mentioned, which is why buyers and investors sometimes approach a mortgage advisor to negotiate on the borrower's behalf. Banks have got some leeway and an advisor can argue that the borrower is in fact a good bet despite appearing otherwise. A gobble said that banks are happy to share in confidence with brokers the rationale behind an application getting declined and mortgage brokers can then sit with the customer to discuss the reasons why the outcome was unsuccessful. One of the main reasons banks say no is a poor credit score. Three credit bureaus, Equifax, Centrix and Illion, hold records on most adult New Zealanders. Some of the information they contain includes a borrower's identity, credit application for five years, power, water and mobile phone accounts, default history, court judgments and full bankruptcies. Credit scores also take into account positive information like paying on time, which allows buyers to revive a failing credit score reasonably quickly. According to Agarwal, if a borrower is turned down for pre-approval and is only at the house hunting stage, there's time to rectify the situation over the next three to six months. A remedy he proposes is working on areas around their default or account conduct, especially when they've missed payments. Banks might want to see a six-month history where all the payments are in order and credit card limits aren't exceeded. He explained that banks want to see that you can manage your financial affairs responsibly, and if your current position doesn't give that confidence to the bank, then no matter how much income you have or how good your deposit is, the bank won't approve your loan. Sometimes potential borrowers might also have easier problems to fix, like automatic payments and direct debits that aren't aligned with the borrower's paydays, which can cause defaults. Agarwal said that the best way to move forward in this situation was to work out a plan with the customer and rectify those shortcomings. A review will also be needed to track their progress every two to three months to make sure they're on the right track. He added that if the client has shown enough evidence that they've mended their ways after six months, they'll present that position either to the same bank or another bank and then tell them their story of where the customer has now become financially responsible. Agarwal mentioned that other situations can be relatively simple to resolve, such as the borrower having too many credit cards or other lines of credit open. And the solution to this would be to reduce the number or the limits. Another thing that people can do to make themselves bankable is not to further deteriorate their position. This means not getting extra debt, such as car loans or credit cards. Banks can also be uncomfortable approving applications from people who've recently changed jobs and are in their trial period. In this case, all the customer needs to do is to continue with their current role with that company, and once their trial period's over, they can request a letter from their employer saying they're now a permanent employee. Now the bank will have confidence that the income they're showing from the current work to service the loan will continue to come in in the foreseeable future. Therefore, the bank will be able to give the loan to the customer. Sometimes it's best to go to a new bank that won't be swayed by the previous application. Agar will explain that the new bank will not be influenced by the previous application and the customer will get a higher chance of a positive outcome from the new bank. Advisors have a better knowledge of how to phrase a borrower's situation in a way that the bank understands. The Credit Contracts and Consumer Finance Act, or CCCFA, is one reason why home buyers can be declined by banks. 
The law is designed to curb irresponsible lending, mainly by loan sharks. When the triple CFA regulations were updated on the 1st of December last year, many borrowers who would have qualified for loans previously were turned down by banks. Anecdotal evidence from some banks have found that they like to help. Second topic for this week in review, we've got the mortgage mag on the 8th of August. Latest survey is good news for the Reserve Bank in New Zealand. A new survey from the Reserve Bank suggests that current inflation levels might not last. The survey also indicates that inflation will come back close to the top of the Reserve Bank targets in 2024. At the moment, the 7.3% price growth is more than double the bank's supposed maximum. The Reserve Bank in New Zealand surveys forecasters, industry leaders and economists every three months to measure the severity of inflation that they're expecting. The latest results showed that one year ahead and two year ahead inflation was expected to decline to 4.86% and 3.07% respectively. Long term inflation was expected to sit close to the midpoint of the Reserve Bank's target band range of 1 to 3%. For example, five years out, inflation was expected to come in at 2.33%, lower than the equivalent number forecast three months ago. In a year's time, the OCR was expected to be at 3.5%. If these sentiments materialise, this will be good news for mortgage advisors because they signal an easing of the recent surge of interest rate rises, which are costly to clients. And they also affect the test rates that banks use uh, when they're testing your affordability. Another part of the survey suggested expectations of economic growth to slow this year and next year, but pick up after that, but at a modest pace. ASB senior economist Mark Smith said that the results would be reassuring to the Reserve Bank and reduce the possibility of a 75-point hike in the OCR this coming week. Nevertheless, he cautions that the Reserve Bank survey was done with a small sample size, so the results must be viewed with caution. Satish Ranchot of Westpac also thought the survey would be good news for the Reserve Bank. At present, inflation's still strong, and it's highly likely that this week's Reserve Bank announcement is going to be an increase of 50 points for the OCR. If you want to learn more about the property market and how things like the OCR can affect it, feel free to join me online or in one of our live events at our free Beginner's Guide to Property Investment sessions which are available online or in person. You can register for upcoming dates and select which date suits you best at propertyapprentice.co.nz. I'll look forward to seeing you there. Third topic for this week in review from landlords.co.nz on the 8th of August, rental prices inch up and property sales slumps to new low. Auckland's weekly rent rose by $6.12 or 1% to $622.44 per week for the quarter ending in June. Compared to a year ago, the increase is 3.27% or $19.70 more per week. And that's from data from 16,000 properties managed by Barfoot and Thompson. Barfoot and Thompson director Kerry Barfoot confirms that the figures are consistent with the trend in recent quarters, which typically sit at about 3% year on year, but she notes that there's many factors at play. One of them is that the market's catching up off the back of frozen and slower moving rents in 2020 and early 2021. In addition, property owners have been working on new levels of compliance and higher operating costs, including rising interest rates and the removal of tax deductibility. All of these put pressure upwards on rental pricing. However, the recent increases have been much lower compared to the 5 and 6% peaks of the past. Contrary to the existing trend, Barfoot believes that rent increases might ease in the coming months. Especially over winter, it's quite common for rents to ease. While not visible in the company's data, Barfoot said that she'd heard of cases across the country, including Auckland, where properties are becoming slower to rent or need a reduction in price to meet the market. This could be partly seasonable, as I said, because people hunker down in the winter months, but it's more likely to be the rising cost of living. So one of the things that we've noticed over previous property cycles is that when living costs increase, people tend to move in together with families so they, they, there's more demand for larger numbers of bedrooms in a property rather than smaller numbers of bedrooms. But, you know, the area that you're investing in can vary greatly. So double check with your property managers as to what sort of properties are most in demand.
Barfoot said people are dealing with tighter budgets and property owners will be recognising the importance of a shorter vacancy and a sustainable tenancy over higher yield. Central Auckland properties dominated by apartments are the cheapest in the quarter at an average of $511.90 per week in June, while homes in the eastern suburbs were the most expensive at an average rent of $702.17 per week. West Auckland, South Auckland and Franklin all offered average weekly rents under $600 a week and by size, four-bedroom homes attracted the most price growth at 3.76% while one and two bedroom homes attracted the least, which, like I said, could be an indication that people are starting to, you know, bunker down together to help keep the cost of living down with increasing rents. Barfoot and Thompson Managing Director Peter Thompson said that the July sales data indicates that the Auckland market is gradually readjusting to a lower sale price point in a controlled manner rather than vendors reacting impulsively to slower sales. He added that there's still a strong flow of new properties reaching the market in July, although lower than normal for this time of year. But nonetheless, this gives buyers new options. While the number of residential properties sold fell significantly, the median sales prices retreated only slowly. The median sales price for the month at $1.11 million has fallen only 2.5% on the average median price over the past three months, and is still 0.8% ahead of the median price in July last year. Compared to the residential market, the rural and lifestyle sectors did not experience the same downward pressure of sales. It experienced the fourth best trading month of the year with sales in excess of $78 million. Fourth topic for this week, one roof on the 9th of August, why the bank of mum and dad is now moving in with the kids. Families in South and West Auckland are pooling their resources in order to get finance. Parents are moving in with their kids as they find ways to help fund their house purchase. Real estate agents in South and West Auckland have told One Roof that some of their buyers are extended families who've joined their incomes in order to secure a mortgage. More families are resorting to this strategy in order to cope with rising interest rates, tougher lending rules and higher house prices. In many cases, mums and dads provide the equity while their adult children have the provable income to service the loan. Ray White Pabakura agent Anthony Russell told One Roof that this happens in lower income communities and where the mum and dad don't own a home. Multi-generational buying often takes place because two incomes aren't enough to service a mortgage, so one or two of the kids will need to help out. Ray White Monaco co-owner Tom Rawson said that he's worked with an older couple and their adult children. The family members are selling their homes so that they can move into one large house. He said buyers in these situations tend to look for four or five bedroom houses or houses that come with a smaller separate dwelling. The family will usually take the main house and the grandparents will take the smaller house. Rawson added that these types of houses, called home and income properties, used to be popular with investors. I'd argue that they still are. Uh, Two-storey houses that had one or two ground floor bedrooms were also popular amongst multi-generational buyers. Homeowners in Rotorua have been taking advantage of their larger sections by adding minor 70 square metre homes. The smaller houses are often meant for extended families to live in. Steve Lovegrove of McDowell Real Estate mentioned that some families were living together to reduce their overall living costs. Mortgage managers, mortgage advisor Stuart Wills observed that more applications are being created by extended families as they look for alternative options to purchase a home. Gathering a home deposit is usually one of the main issues that people need to deal with. In many cases, four family members with $20,000 each is a lot better than two members with $20,000 each. Rawson said that he's dealing with several applications where adult children are looking to build a new house at the back of their parents' section. He said that the parents often had good savings, including KiwiSaver, to use as the deposit, but were unable to pay it off the loan before they retired, so the adult children's incomes helped get the application over the line. Harcourt's Mount Roskill co-owner Nick Cocker knows of several families where the mum and dad and adult children all had income and had decided on buying together to get lending. The main reason why families were doing this was because of how difficult it is to get finance. 
Parents can help the children with the deposit by using the equity in their current house. He's helping one multi-generational family upgrade to a bigger house so they can all live together, but said it's more common in his area to see parents help their children buy a house without moving in, by way of equity gifts, for example. Fifth topic for this week in review, RNZ on the 10th of August, falling house prices put some homeowners into negative equity. Negative equity is what happens when the mortgage value exceeds the sale value of a property, and this is fast becoming a problem for some home buyers. Prices are expected to continue to decline over the next year. The latest data from Quotable Value shows that the national average house price fell 4.9% over the past three months to $989,790. However, property research firm CoreLogic said negative equity was only a problem for homeowners if they decided to sell. CoreLogic chief property economist Calvin Davidson noticed that this is probably the situation of buyers who purchased property within the third and fourth quarter of last year and have seen the value of their property fall since then. So in other words, they were buying at the peak of the market and now that the market's starting to correct, their value in the property might be less than what they actually paid for it to begin with or less than what the mortgage is at the moment. So, however, the tight labour market and rising wages meant that there wasn't a lot of pressure to sell. That's as long as people were able to stay in employment. And, you know, if people lose their jobs at the moment because of the tight labour market, as long as they're willing to look for for other types of employment, chances are they'll be able to find another job if they're not too fussy. You know, there's certainly lots of uh, lots of advertising at the moment from, from people looking for low-skilled work, for example, just to potentially tide you over if you need a bit of extra help. According to Davidson, negative equity doesn't need to be a disaster. It's not great for the mindset, perhaps, but financially it doesn't need to be a total disaster. Another issue for people would be servicing their mortgage at higher rates. However, homeowners can offset these costs, if possible, by tightening their belts. He believes there's a very slim chance of a scenario taking place where homeowners are suffering from negative equity and are falling behind on mortgage payments. And I suspect the reason that he believes that there's a slim chance of that happening is um, because you know there are there's such a shortage of workers in the workforce at the moment. So thank you for listening to this week in review. I'm Debbie from Property Apprentice. I'll look forward to seeing you at one of our free events if you haven't already heard from us. If you've got suggestions for future weekly podcasts in addition to these weeks in review, please let us know. Just email office at propertyapprentice.co.nz and we'll be happy to put that into our schedule. Thanks for listening.